So when I was, uh, was in high school, I played baseball. Uh, loved to play it. Didn't love watching it. Uh, now as an adult, I can't watch it enough. Nothing better to me than a little Sunday afternoon baseball. Some of you may call that nap time. Um, but absolutely love it. And my, uh, my earliest memories, sports memories as a child, I grew up in Southern California, was my grandparents uh, taking me to Dodger games. And I'd love to say I was super excited about the game or the players. But what I was really excited about is I knew about the fourth inning. My grandpa was going to give me one of those plastic Dodger helmets. And inside that helmet was going to be a whole lot of ice cream. And I've been a dedicated fan ever since. <laughs> So this year, of course, though, was a big year for us. Yes, I said us. I play center armchair. Uh, it was a big year for us because we won the World Series. Now, I don't expect you to cheer because this is Ray's country, and I understand. But uh, I was very excited about it, and I'm a little embarrassed to tell you this. It was the final game. I'm standing at the front of my TV like this. I know it's the thing I tell my girls don't do, but I'm standing like this. The final pitch is thrown, and I don't know what happens to me. I'm a little embarrassed, but I'm overwhelmed with emotion. I begin to cry. No, it's true. I do. It gets way worse, though, because uh, this is like midnight. I come busting into our room. I think Chris is asleep. I don't know. I jump on the bed, and I tackle her, and I go, we won the World Series! <laughs> and she looks at me and says, I'm happy for you. What is wrong with you? A whole lot, but I am done with dysfunction. So high school, played baseball, very excited, freshman year, I played t-ball growing up, all the things we're going to learn, all the things we're going to get into, and we get to the first day of practice, and we, we work on one single thing. In fact, it's pretty much the only thing we work on all week and into the next week, and it was our batting stance. The whole first week, we spend an incredible amount of time on one single thing, how to have a proper swing. I could, I could use a little help. I need a good cleanup hitter. Pastor Tom, perfect. Hey, Jacob, would you mind playing? One of my favorite things about baseball is their walkout music. Her? Okay. I see you, Big Papa. You know, there's, there's something. Eh, something's missing. Give me a second. I got it. I got it. I got it. Oh, uh, let's see, let's see. Oh, let's see. Oh, hoo, hoo, hoo. You're looking pretty fresh as a Dodgers fan. Not too bad. So let's say, Pastor Tom, he's up to bat right now. And our coach would tell us this as we began practice. He's like, if you miss this, if you miss this, it's going to affect you every time you get up to bat. So let's say, Pastor Tom, you're up. Here's our plate right here. But let's say you're a little too timid. Let's say you're a little too far off the plate. Well, if Pastor Tom's a little too far off the plate, what's going to happen is there's going to be some things in his zone. There's going to be some things he should swing at. There's going to be some things meant for him, but he's not going to be able to hit it because he's too far off the plate. Now, let's say the reverse is true. Let's say you're right on top of the plate. Let's say he's too aggressive. If he's too aggressive, that means there's going to be some things you shouldn't swing at, but you're going to swing at it. There are going to be some things that really aren't meant for you, but you're not going to be able to resist. Now, you're, you're right-handed. When you're on the right side, you crush it. On the right side, you rake. On the right side, pitchers look at you and their knees start to shake. But what would happen if you came to the left side? See, if Pastor Tom's on the left side, he loses his power. If he's on the left side, he loses his efficiency. Why? It's not his side. It's not how he is wired. It's not his lane. Our coach would tell us, if you miss this, then every time you get up to bat, you're going to miss out on opportunities to get on base. You're going to have teammates who are on base, but you won't be able to bring them home if you miss this. And I hope you get this. You won't be able to hit with your full power or your full potential. See, the right swing is foundational if I'm going to succeed as a baseballer. Hey, can we give it up for Pastor Tom? And listen, many of us, we may be missing out on our full potential because there's some brokenness in our swing. See, when we look around at, at life, it can feel as if life is about achievement. And we're sort of conditioned this way from a young age, right? You get into school, and what's the goal? Achieve good enough grades to get into the next grade. 
and then eventually high school, and then to get good enough grades in high school to go to college or get into a trade, and then to get into a career, and in that career, what do we do? We achieve, we achieve, we achieve. Now, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that, but it can lead to us feeling like life is about what I achieve, and it is so much more. Uh, Years ago, the poet David White, he was leading an organization, and the organization was going really well. It was very successful, but he was tired. He was burnt out. He was exhausted. And one day he's sitting with a Benedictine monk. And he just sort of blurts out to the monk. He says, tell me about exhaustion. And the monk looks at him and says, you know, the antidote to exhaustion is not rest. See, the antidote to exhaustion is wholeheartedness. Wholeheartedness. See, life isn't about achievement. Life is about wholeness. Now, we chase achievement because we think it'll give us satisfaction, but satisfaction is actually found when I am whole. Because here's what happens when I'm whole. I can take full swings at life. When I'm whole, I I can live up to my full potential, my full power. I can be happy, stable, fruitful, blessed. I'll be full of joy. But when there are wounds, when there's hurt, when there's pain, when there's dysfunction, from my past. I don't swing as well. Why? Because there's some brokenness in my swing. And today I want to get into a a very difficult subject. I think for many of us, this is the place that has caused our greatest pain. It's the place that has truly affected our swing this morning. I want to preach from the topic, healing the father wound. Healing the father wound. A little bit about my backstory. My dad left when I was in high school. Now, he wasn't always around to begin with, wasn't always super present, wasn't always there, but in high school, he was gone. Now, I had forgiven him a couple of years later, but I had missed a prompting of God. And when I missed that prompting of God, it allowed brokenness to stay in my swing for 17 years. It wasn't until about five months ago that God healed my father wound. You see, just because you've forgiven someone doesn't mean you've been healed from all the pain they have caused. Just because you've forgiven someone doesn't mean you've been healed from all the pain they have caused. Healing the father wound. And here's what I know. This is going to apply to a lot of us. Some of you, you hear this and you go, I'm right there with you and even more. I have been hurt by my earthly father. I'm carrying that wound. I'm carrying that pain. But others, it's tempting in this moment to kind of go, nope, that's not me. I can back off. I don't have to really pay attention. But here's what I ask. No matter how good your dad was or is, doesn't change the fact that he was not perfect. And if there is hurt, if there is pain, will you open yourself up to your heavenly father? Allow him to speak. And if there is not, that is incredible. You have been given one of life's most profound gifts. And so we're going to talk today about the God who will pull you from your past to take you to your future. You can't outrun your story, but you can Run to the Father. And so this morning I have one idea, and I want to wrap the whole message around this one thought. Your Heavenly Father longs to heal your father wound. Your Heavenly Father longs to heal your father wound. In psychology, there's what's called family systems theory. And the theory states that our experiences in our family of origin, in our childhood, is what shapes the different experiences and systems in our life. So that means a few things. First, that's our filter. And so the way we approach relationships, communication, conflict, decision-making, our worldview is shaped by our family of origin. And if you're married, you found that out pretty quickly when you got married. Second, we can't escape it. And we'd love to think I can just leave the things of my past, the pain in my childhood, I can leave it there. But if that pain is not healed, it will continue to shape our future. And third, the relationship we had or did not have with our parents, it is the primary relationship that shapes our actions and behaviors. And that's why you could be 60 years old, but you still feel the weight of a father wound. And and here's why I share all this. If when we were five, and psychologists will say between the ages of two and five, But if when we were five, if our father was not present, not mother too, but particularly father, if he was not present, if he was not loving, 
if he was not safe, if he was not available, then we as adults will begin to build our life in a way that protects the five-year-old version of us. And so my father was extremely inconsistent. So as an adult, what did I become? I became an overachieving perfectionist. Why? Because dad was not consistent. I will always be. And if there's brokenness in your story, in your past, then you've responded in some way too. Now, it may not have been like me, but in some way you formed your life in reaction to that wound. See, because of my father wound for years, my identity was, I'm the overachieving perfectionist. Dad was not present. Dad was not there. I will always be. And your heavenly father, he wants to step back into your story, into your past, and take you to your future. Because there may have been an identity you felt like you had to put on. It's all I know. It's the best I can do. I'm just trying to survive over here, so I'm going to grab whatever identity I can to mask this wound. And the God of heaven wants to step into your story and tell you that is not your future. That may have been your past, but that does not get to define the present and what God has for you. There may have been a mask you felt like you had to put on, but it is over. It comes off today. You may have came in here with something. It does not get to follow you out. So I want to go back to our text, Matthew 3, 16 to 17, because I believe this is one of the most profound texts for us to understand our identity as sons and daughters of God. Again, Matthew 3, 16, it says, When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest on him. Behold, a voice from heaven said, This is is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Jesus is called the beloved before he does anything. There's no miracles. There's no teachings. There's no disciples. There's no crowds. There's, there's none of that. In fact, Jesus is 30 years old, still living at home. Jesus was the first millennial. But for 30 years, he's been in obscurity. 30 years, he's been in a tiny town that no one's really heard of. And what does the father do? He affirms his identity. You see, God is far more interested in you than he is in your performance. Now, through my 20s and my early 30s, I didn't believe that. Because I wasn't worthy of my earthly dad's love, so I felt like I had to prove to my heavenly father I'm worthy. How did I do it? Degrees? Let me get an undergraduate degree, a graduate degree, a doctoral degree. Let me achieve more in life. Let me become a professor. Let me achieve more here. And although some of that was good motives, there was always this voice in the back of my head saying, maybe if I do enough, I could be worthy of God's love. See, you can't outrun the lack of a father's love, but you can run to the father. And there will come a day where you no longer achieve. And on that day, As this day, the Father will look at you and say, you are still my beloved. Second thing I want you to notice, it's one thing to know God's love, but it's another thing to be known by the Father. God doesn't send a message to Jesus. Now, throughout the whole gospel story, that's what he's done. He sent angels. But not here, not now. What does he do? He tears open heaven and earth to speak to his son. You see, you are seen by God. You are known by God. And you are heard by the Father. Now, it's natural for us to project the way our earthly father was onto God. We can't help it. We we do it instinctively. And here's why. Because we're meant to. We're meant to. As an earthly father... It is my primary identity that I am to show Ellie and Olivia what God the Father is like. And this is the prime place that Satan will attack from a young age and continue to attack in your life is your view of God as Father. Because if from a young age or if from any age you understand that I am seen, I am known, and I am heard by the Father, then it's game over. It's done. It's checkmate. There is nothing Satan can do because your identity is solidified in what God thinks of you. And this is why. This is why it's so hard to be a dad. This is why it's a challenge. This is why it's always portrayed so negatively in culture. 
because we're the primary shaping factors of how our kids view God. If we are loving, the Heavenly Father must be loving. If we're kind, the Heavenly Father must be kind. Now, this is not about perfection. It's not about getting it all right. And in fact, if, you, if your kids see that you show yourself grace when you mess up, well, the Heavenly Father must be about grace as well. And if you're a father in here, you need to hear this. You have what it takes. Amen. Otherwise, they wouldn't be your kids. You have what it takes. And whatever you feel like is missing, God will put in you. And for those of you dads in here who's, who you've adopted, what a noble and incredible thing. You have what it takes. Or God would have brought those children to someone else. And it's not lost on me that half the dads in here and watching online, you're stepdads. And I can only imagine how hard it is to be a stepdad. I've got a wonderful one, a wonderful one. But it would not have been easy to be my stepdad early on. It would have been difficult. It would have been hard. But what an image we're given. You know what God does when he saves us, when he rescues us? He brings us into his family. And if you're a stepdad in here or you've adopted, you're a lot like your heavenly father because you've brought those children into your family. So dad, you have what it takes. And those voices in your head that say, you can't do this. You didn't have a dad. How can you be a dad? Those are lies from Satan. You have what it takes. And whatever you feel like is missing, God will provide. He will step in. He will fill in the gap. And those voices are not from him because your heavenly father, he believes in you. And he knew what he was doing when he gave you those kids. So whether you're 65 or whether you're 25, you have what it takes. And your heavenly father, he believes in you and you're known by God. So it's one thing to know God's love. It's another thing to be known by the father. And this is why it's so hard to believe this. Because if our earthly father wasn't there, or if our earthly father abandoned us or left us, then it's so hard to believe how could my heavenly father be any different. But I want you to know, he's pleased with you. And more specifically, you need to hear this. Let it sit for a moment. God is pleased to be your father. You're not a burden to him. You're his son. You're his daughter. You are not what you produce to him. You are not a waste of time to him. You're none of those things. He is pleased to be your father. You make God happy. You're a joy to him. And he's pleased to be your father on your best day. And he's pleased to be your father on your worst day. On the day where you didn't want anything to do with him. On the day where you couldn't have been farther away from him. He still looks at you with loving arms and says, I'm pleased to be your father come home. Come home. And what you think will get met with frustration, will get met with open arms and open love. The Father is proud of you. And I want to turn now to 1 John 3.1, because I believe this text, it's going to give us the foundation to be able to swing with wholeness. 1 John 3.1, the first half of the verse, says, see what kind of love The Father has given to us that we should be called God's children, and so we are. In every man, there's a question or a form of it. Do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes? This is the question that shapes our decisions, our actions, our behaviors. Most of us, we're in the career we're in because somewhere along the way, someone spoke to us and said, I think you could do that. I think you have what it takes. That's my story. I was a five-year-old little boy, leaving a Wednesday night church service. I looked to my grandma and I said, I'm gonna be a pastor. But by the time I got to high school, because of my family of origin story, that was the last thing on my mind. There's no way that was gonna happen. I had totally even forgot that ever existed. Went to a private school, preached in the senior chapel. It went well, but that's not why I felt called to ministry. It's because people who I knew loved me, people who I trusted came alongside me and said, no, I think you could do that. It doesn't matter what your story was. You could be a good pastor. You could be a good preacher. I'm in ministry because somewhere along the line, someone answered that question. I think you have what it takes. And in every woman, there's a core question or a form of it. Am I worthy of love? Am I worthy of love? A couple weeks ago, Chris and I were getting the girls ready to go swimming, and 
She put them in their bathing suits, and my little two-year-old, Livy, comes running out. Go ahead and put that picture up of Livy. <laughs> she comes running out, and here's what she was saying. I pretty. I pretty. I pretty. We didn't teach her to do that. Why? It's innate. What is she really saying? Am I worthy of love? Every night when I put my girls down, I go into Ellie's room, my four-year-old, I get up on her bed with her, I look her in the eyes and I say, Ellie, daddy loves you. You are worthy of love. Go into my two-year-old's room, Livy, daddy loves you. You're worthy of love. And as long as I have breath in my lungs, my girls are going to hear from me, daddy loves you. You're worthy of love. Why? Because if it's true of me, it must be true of their heavenly father. And both of these questions, do I have what it takes and am I worthy of love? They find their answer in this text. Oh, what great love the Father has given. Now, how does the author know this? How can he be so sure? Because of what God has done. See what great love the Father has given, that we should be called God's children. And so we are. So the answer to the question, do I have what it takes? The father looks at you and says, yes, you're my son. I believe in you. You can do this. You have what it takes. And the answer to the question, am I worthy of love? The father looks at you and says, yes, I adore you. You are beautiful. You are worthy of love. You're worthy of God's love. He believes in you. You're known by him and he wants to make you whole. And that begins with you and I seeing him as father. Now, God is many things. He is creator. He is redeemer. He is sustainer. But above all those things, first and foremost, he's father. Now, how can we be so sure of that? How do we know? Because when I open the Bible, there's a lot of titles for God. But here's how we know. The Trinity. Because in the Trinity is where we find the ontology of God, which means the study of God's being, God at his very essence. Who is God at his very core? And in the Trinity, we're given very specific titles. There is the Son, there is the Holy Spirit, and the Father. See, for all eternity, he has been Father. You and I, we didn't make him Father. He always was, and he always will be. Amen. God at his very essence, God at his very core is Father. Let me put it to you this way. When Chris and I first met, we were friends. Then we started dating, and then we got married. And when the identity shifted, the relationship changed. How do you identify God? Is he sovereign Lord? Is he creator? Is he God of all? Or is he father? Because until we see him as father, we won't experience the fullness of our swing. I always thought, well, it's just about operating out of the Holy Spirit. And what I found is that's not completely true. We operate out of the Father's love. And it is through our understanding of the Father's love that we are then empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so for most of my life, I jumped to the Holy Spirit without settling my identity as a beloved son. But it is the Father's love or the lack of a Father's love that drives actions and behaviors. Who I am as a follower of Christ is completely locked into my understanding of God as Father. Listen to Jesus. What does he say? I do nothing on my own, but only what I see the Father doing. Back in January, from the result of a number of different things, I ended up with cervical radiculopathy, which in plain English is intense nerve pain. And it is the most intense pain that I've ever experienced in my life. But through it all, God has so demonstrated his love and mercy for me. So this started back in, in January, and we were in probably the second week of January, and we were over at some friend's house, and all day long, the pain had kind of been building and building. At one point, we're over there for dinner, and I sneak away to the car, and I'm in the car for about 10 minutes, just in tears. I'm in so much pain. I come back, and Carissa can see kind of the anguish on my face, and she says, hey, let's, um, let's take you home. So we go home. She drops me off, and she says, hey, I'm going to give you a little time by yourself. I'm going to go run some errands. So I get into the house. I stumble in. I make it to our bedroom, and I just fall on the floor, 
and I am shaking in pain. As soon as Carissa gets home, she's going to have to take me to the ER. And then it happens. The same thing that's happened almost every day for the, those two weeks, the same two thoughts begin to pop into my head. I have to get better. I have to be strong. I have to be better. I have to be strong. And no matter how hard I try, I can't get those two thoughts out of my head. It just repeats over and over for 10 minutes. But then God speaks, not audibly, but to my heart. Jordan, who told you you had to be strong? And I begin to weep. I begin to lose it. See, the reason why I couldn't get those two questions, those two thoughts out of my head was because that was my reaction when my dad left. I'll never be weak again. I'll never be vulnerable. I'll never be put in a place where I could ever be abandoned. I will always be pushing forward. I'll always be achieving. I will always be the most consistent person I know. Why? I was reacting to a wound, and in a moment, God performed open-heart surgery, and it felt as if for 17 years— I had been dragging this invisible bag full of a father wound. And in a moment, the bag was gone. It felt as if this incredible weight was lifted off of my shoulders. And that nerve pain that was a 10 went down to about a 1. And so Carissa gets home, and for the next three hours, she was incredible because she was like my counselor. As I'm pouring out all of the pain, all of the hurt, all of the weight, all of the dysfunction, this big old wound that I have allowed to guide and direct my life. But in a moment, God intervenes and says, I'm going to take you from your past to your future. I've got a better story for you. You know, God heals all the time. He heals physically. But one of the primary places that he needs to heal in your life is emotional. And if you're carrying a father wound on earth, it will block your view of your heavenly Father in heaven. And if your story is anything like mine, you came in here carrying that weight. But the Father, he wants you to feel the weight of his love, that he wants to step back into your past with you, that he's not forgotten about the hurt, he's not forgotten about the pain, about the trauma. It's not lost on him, but he doesn't want to leave you there. He wants to take you from that pain to a better future that you may have walked in here with a father wound, but it does not get to follow you out.